good evening to all i welcome you all to the global forum master class in which the participants countries like india sri lanka bangladesh and nepal are all together in collaboration for the enrichment and dissemination of knowledge for all our students and for this particular class we are dealing on two aspects one is oski and ospi which is very important for postgraduate curricula as well as we have another case based discussion a class on heart failure subsequently we have with us Uh, the president of association of physicians of india professor girish mathur welcome sir uh, we have uh, the president of sri lanka college of internal medicine uh, dr kumudini jay singhe welcome madam okay. we, uh, yes uh, we are uh, supposed to have with us other dignitaries uh, president of simon from nepal dr orun maske who will be joining us a bit later and the dean professor jyotirmoy pal he will also will be subsequently joining so uh, i would just request professor mathur to say a few words so that we can get on with the class thank you nandini on behalf of api i extend a very warm welcome to all of you on this master class organized on the global forum i especially welcome our friends from bangladesh sri lanka and nepal professor jalil choudhry dr kumudni jay singhe professor nawal vijay singhe i welcome dr nandini nandini joint secretary dean indian college of physicians and all the friends it's my pleasure to join this global class this evening i at the outset i compliment dean indian college of physicians dr jyotirmoy paul to take this initiative to form this global forum this global forum will promote active academic interaction among its member countries and will serve our aim to disseminate dissemination of knowledge in a much better way last week i traveled to bangladesh dhaka to attend the annual conference of association of physicians of bangladesh and i was very impressed with the scientific and educational content of the conference i also had the opportunity to have a meeting of global forum with president of simon nepal and apb and we discussed the plans to go forward i hope we will do many more academic activities in future on the joint forum i compliment again dr jyotirmoy paul for his chosen as key as a subject of discussion today since our skills of much relevance to post graduate students for their teaching and learning i am grateful to the organizers for giving the opportunity to interact with you my best wishes for the success of this global class thank you so much Uh, uh, Dr. Kumudini, ma'am, to say a few words. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nandini. Good evening, everyone. Actually, it's my pleasure to join and be a partner in this Global Forum Masterclass, uh, which is organized by APICP in India in collaboration with Bangladesh. Uh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Girish Mathur, uh, President of API, and also Dr. Jalil Jodri from Bangladesh, and uh, uh, Professor Na Anamal Vijay Singh, uh, and uh, Dr. Kethmini uh, Elipala from Sri Lanka, representing Sri Lanka College of Intermedicine from Sri Lanka. And I must thank uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tirmo. 
Maipo, sorry, um, Dirty Maipo Pal and Dr. Uh, Nantini for organizing this academic forum. It's a wonderful academic forum and facilitating all of us to share our knowledge and the experiences with us. And also, I must thank uh, the speakers today, Dr. Jalil Chaudhary from Bangladesh and uh, uh, Prasanna Amal Vijay Singh and Dr. Kitmini Adlepola and uh, Dr. Uh, Ganaka Sena Ratna, our immediate past president from the college and uh, all the other uh, speakers uh, for their great contribution. So I hope that we can witness a very wonderful uh, global forum class today. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, 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 Dr. Arun Maske from Nepal is also here. Uh, so I also will uh, ask him to say something and then we will go on uh, to, we'll hand over the mic to Professor Chaudhuri to take on the class. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes please. Sir. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And it's a very good uh, initiative. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Nanidhi. And thank you, Professor Mathur and everybody else. Let's start the class. Thank you. Uh, Professor Chaudhuri. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, sir. Now the stage is yours and please, sir, let us begin with our class. Thank you, Professor Nandini. Yes. Uh, at the outset, I must thank the organizers of uh, Global Forum for inviting me to uh, share with you some aspects of OSCE or OSPI. Though this is the, for the, uh, this uh, class is for the students, but I see here so many dignitaries, mm -hmm. especially Professor uh, Girish Mathur, President APB, and uh, Dr. Kumudini, and Dr. Namal, Dr. Arun Maskai, and so many others. I hope that uh, Professor Jutimapal will join uh, soon. So I am going uh, straight forward to my uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, do you see my presentation, Professor Nandini? Nandini? Professor Nandini? Is it visible? No, no. sir. It takes time for sharing. Is yes, it so? sir. You, ta you take your, be relaxed and take your time. We are. If you uh, can see me, uh, you just respond. Uh, I think my uh, now on, onward I will talk for the students only, not okay. for the teachers. <laughs> if no, we are, no, no. If, if we Once are, we get to see only, it. Only, only, for, only for the students. Yes. So no, uh, it is a learning experience for us also, sir. Okay, no problem. Okay. If we can uh, time, we can share later on. Okay. Because time is limited. Actually, uh, this is not a OSCE session. Actually, for, for the students, I am talking for the students. This is a uh, OSPI. Moreover, this is not a speech session. This is a, a bit a type of quiz type. If you get time in future, we will arrange in collaboration with the Global uh, Forum a real face-to-face uh, uh, speech -face session in near future if we get time. So uh, this is actually neither a OSPI nor a OSPI just a quiz session, but this is two part. First part, I will ask some question for the students. They will answer in the a chat box, as we discussed earlier with Professor Nandini. Uh, after finishing, then I will go for real OSPI uh, stations or, uh, or questions which we put in the examination and how this is, we, I will show how this is constructed, how this object will be prepared, how this is structured, how the marking scheme is uh, done, and how the students should answer the question. I will show it later on uh, for discussion. So is it, is it visible now? Why? Professor Sorry. Paul has joined. Professor Jyotin Mai Paul. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Jyotin Mai Paul is the Dean ICP. Uh, sir, as uh, the slide sharing has not started yet, would you say a few words? Yes, I welcome uh, all the students 
and all the uh, all the speakers in this global forum webinar and and I, I am very happy that that we are conducting such a webinar along with our neighbor countries and professor jolil choudhury is a renowned man he has a, a excellent book on oski but uh, but i must say that book is not available in india so there is a huge demand so if professor choudhury can talk with his publisher and make this book available in india my thank small appeal to him yes. thank you professor paul for uh, for uh, attending the session we will be encouraged by your presence so is it visible uh, now is it visible yes, now yes 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 okay. sir it is fully visible, visible. you make now it we can, uh, we can continue okay we yes, can continue sir, please so as I uh, talked earlier, this is neither a OSCE nor a OSCE class. This is just a quiz, quiz. But second part will be real OSCE. So for the students, uh, it is visible now, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, OK. Uh, so the, there's a test station. This station one is on or chest X-ray. In instance, is like that, a six, 46 years old man present with cough. So now study the chest X-ray PU view and also lateral view and answer the following questions. Question one, let me ask the first question. And you write a brief answer on the chat box. We will collect it. What is the most likely diagnosis? Just write the diagnosis by studying the both PA view and lateral view. Next question. Mention two treatment options for this case. You just mentioned, right, two treatment options for this case. So let me proceed to next session. So this is session two. This photograph has been taken from my ward a few years back. This is a real, not from internet, this is from real patient. This displayed photograph shows the lower limbs. You see the lower limbs of a 45 years old man with a bottle containing his urine. This con uh, bottle contains urine. Study the photograph and give answer the following questions. Question one, let me ask the first question. What does the bottle most likely contain? This is urine, no doubt, but actually what does the bottle actually contain? You can write in the chat box. Okay. Let me ask the second question. What does the bottle most? Uh, second question. Suggest one test with the contents of the bottle that will be appropriate for the scenery. So, uh, so many participants answered the question. We will discuss later on. Actually, you will self, you will assess self. This will be better. Yes, sir. They will. Uh, you will discuss the answers, and they yeah. will understand and assess on their own. Okay, this, this will be better. So, next question. On ECG, station three on ECG. 
a 60 years old man was brought to the emergency room in a collapsed state. His blood pressure was 90 by 70 millimeter mercury. He had chest tightness for four hours. Study the ECG and give answers to the following questions. Let me ask the first question. What is the electrocardiographic diagnosis? Just write the diagnosis, not the finding, just write the diagnosis. Yes, yes. Okay, let me ask the second question. Write two most urgent investigations you want to do in the next step. In OSCE or OSPI, you should um, uh, understand the every uh, word of the question. Here, most urgent investigation you want to do in the next step. So you write two in, uh, urgent investigation in the next uh, step, only two investigations. Okay, somebody has written uh, some answers. We'll discuss later on. So we should uh, move to next uh, station. This is an MRC. This is an um, image. Uh, station on MRCP, not MRCP examination. This is an investigation. <laughs> this instruction, follow this instruction. A 50 year old man presented with abdominal pain, vomiting, and fever for seven days. On query, he said that he had suffered three attacks of jaundice and abdominal pain within the last one year. Study this MRCP and answer the following questions. Let me ask the first question. What should be the clinical diagnosis? Depending on this scenario and this image finding, what should be your clinical diagnosis? Write in the chat, chat box, please. What, the, what should be the clinical diagnosis? OK, somebody has answered. Next, uh, let me answer the second question. Name one important clinical sign, clinical sign on abdominal examination for this case in dignity. Depending on this scenario and image, uh, you mention one important clinical sign that you expect on abdominal examination, one clinical sign. Okay, I can proceed to the next session. We will discuss later on. This is uh, station five on ABC. Because in OSPI and OSCE station, we actually give one from X ray, one for CT scan, one for MRI, one for image or photo, one from ABC mast, and so on. So, this is in station a 72 years old man, known with diabetes, hypertension, and COPD. Presented the history of fever, respiratory distress, and falling blood pressure. Upon admission in the ICU, capillary blood glucose was found 21 millimole per liter, and ABG was done. Please interpret the ABG report and answer the following questions. Let me ask the now. You plus see the ABG first. You have to answer question from this uh, ABG, and this is the actual actual um, ABG tip collected from the world. Let me ask the first question. Identify the four most important abnormal parameters in this ABG strip. There are so many findings here, but we need some important parameters by which we can diagnose the ABG abnormalities. So you have to identify from this um, uh, ABG strip four most, four most important abnormal parameters. Four, only four.
Okay, somebody has answered. So, uh, second question, let me uh, show the second question. So, what is the acid based disorder? You write down only the diagnosis acid based disorder. Okay, no problem. We move to second case. This is an uh, MRI. MRI brain. Uh, I am reading the instruction. A 36 years old woman with eclampsia. That means she, she is pregnant. Presented with headache and altered level of consciousness for two days. Her blood pressure was 210 by 120. So high accelerated blood pressure. She was brought to the emergency and MRI of brain was done. Let me ask the first question. There are two images, image one, image two. Study the MRI sequence in image one first. Either this one. Done at emergency and describe the findings. Right, with simple words. Describe the findings or enumerate the findings or mention the findings for image one only. Second question will be now study the MRI image of the uh, image two, this one, image two, done after two weeks. This was first one done at emergency and this was done after two weeks. And you have to mention what changes has happened in the image two. This is the question. You first see the image one, write the findings, then see the image two, and see what changes has happened. That means findings in the image two. I think this is easier for the students. <laughs> okay. So I am moving to uh, next uh, next session. This is spirometry. Uh, uh, this source of spirometry is given in the OSCE session, but it is difficult to have some good picture. The spirometry picture is not so good. So we try to uh, have a good picture. I will request the uh, students to see the also the reports here, so they can then they can, they can diagnose the whole thing. But because of the bad imaging, actually they may not understand this uh, image. So if you see image and reports, then you could answer the questions. So in instruction is such, a 55 year old man was admitted in a teaching hospital for lab call. As a part of pre anesthetic checkup and evaluation of shortness of breath and un unproductive cough, the lung function test, that means spirometry was done. Study the spirograph, this one, and give answer to the following questions. So first question will be, what is the spirometric diagnosis? You put your diagnosis on the basis of spirometry. I mentioned you see the graph and you see the report. And you then you can um, uh, guess the diagnosis, spirometric diagnosis. So, uh, so many have answered, some are right, some are wrong. We will discuss later on. Second question. I am going to second question. To which clinical diagnosis the lung function test, lung function abnormalities fits best? That means what should be the clinical diagnosis? Actually, the question is what is the clinic, what should be the clinical diagnosis? But for better understanding, we written the sentence in, in this way that to which clinical diagnosis the lung function abnormalities fits best. You write one word or two word, the diagnosis. So, okay, we'll discuss that on ILD. This is the station eight. 
this is on uh, barium enema. Though this source of investor is outdated nowadays, but these are these are, are of historical importance. That is why I put this uh, image here. Study the field, answer the following questions. I have not put any scenario here. There is some reason here. We'll, we'll see. First question. What are the radiological findings in this image? What are the, that means more than one findings. What are the radiological findings here? And second question, what is the most likely diagnosis? That means clinical diagnosis. So first question, what are the radiological findings and what is the most likely diagnosis? Uh, Dr. Nigar Sultana is sitting by, by beside me to collect these answers from chat box. Thank you, Dr. Nigar Sultana. Okay, so many answers is there. Okay, see, hold on, Fisher sign. Pulled up CCAM, IBD, etc. Okay, okay, no, no problem. Next, we are, we are, we are moving to uh, second one, uh, last uh, nine. Nine scenario, there is a CT hat. I mentioned that there will be one MRI, one CT, usually. So this is a 60, 60 years old hypertensive right handed man. Uh, a right-handed man presented with left-sided hemiplegia. Mind it, the, the person is a right-handed man with left-sided hemiplegia and altered level of consciousness for the last 40 hours. His blood pressure on admission was 170 by 100 mg mercury without any anti drug. Possibly he stopped the anti drug. Study the CT image of his brain and give answer the following questions. Question one. Describe the abnormal findings in the image. You can stick to one image. Um, you, don't know, you, you need not see the all image. If you focus on one image and can get the findings, write the findings. Second question, who is cerebral artery territory is involved here? Depending on the findings you tell or write, who is cerebral artery territory is involved here? Right MCA, right MCA, right MCA. Okay, good. Some answer are correct, some answer are wrong. Next question. There is one more question here. What will be the state of his speech if the person survives? What will be the state of his speech if the person survives? What will happen to his speech? Aphysia, speech normal. Aphysia, speech normal. So, okay, we'll discuss later on, no problem. Some are right, some are correct. City hat. <laughs> Next, we'll proceed to last one, last city, last uh, um, question. This is a electrophoresis report. This sort of report is given in the hospital stations. Actually, auspicious are done for the uh, this, uh, this table viva, which used to uh, use in the past. This is converted into auspicious for making it more objective, to make it more structured, to make, have a uh, structured uh, answer scheme. I will show. A 60 years old man present with low back pain and generalized ache, generalized body ache, body pain. Study the report and give answer the following questions. Here are only two questions, I think. First question, mention the abnormalities in the graph. Graph. But I will I will request the students to see the graphs as well. You will see the reports also. So then you can make a good answer. 
So mention the F node in the graph. M bent. M bent. There is gamma globulin. We don't know microglobulin. Okay, good. Most of them are correct, but some are incorrect answer also. Let me ask the second question. I think this is the last question. List three other diagnosis tests to confirm the most likely condition. This is an almost recall type of question. List three other diagnosis tests to confirm the most likely condition, which was in your mind after seeing the graph. Bonmero, even protein, monoclonal band, CSF study, CSF study. Okay. Okay. And due to time constraint, I am proceed to my next presentation, which will be based on the real hospice station, who is used to put in our examination, who is students should face during examination. And if we can arrange a hospice, um, uh, this, this sort of orientation class or course on spot, which should be the uh, pattern of questioning I will I will show at, at, at next uh, next presentation. That means I will cross the border. There is a good fencing in between the two countries, but there is no border in our mind. I think so. I am crossing the borders. You see, already we have seen this X-ray presentation. There are four questions for the real question, real examination, and this is for. Uh, five minutes. You, 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 I think you have experience regan, de, 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 de giving uh, speak, um, examinations and by rotation. rotation uh, a bell will ring after five minutes. You have to move to the next session. So for the five uh, five minutes, uh, this question has been arranged. Um, uh, so first question. In this session, I already said, these are the two important the findings of diagnostic importance. You see? You see? It looks like lung abscess, but if you see carefully, there are uh, food residue in this lateral view. You cannot see here, but you can see food material because if you consider this is lung abscess, at a glance, it seems to be lung abscess, but if you see this lateral view, this cannot be lung abscess. So again, you see the scenario. This person presents with dysphagia. A lung of the patient should not present with dysphagia. So this uh, this uh, this uh, question, this word has come some significant. But cough and chest tightness may be in both lung abscess, and uh, that means uh, achalasia. So finding used to be fluid level behind the cardiac shadow. This is fluid level, and uh, food residue in the P view, and food residue in the lateral view. So diagnosis will be achalasia cardia. That is more that is that during moderation, the question may be changed. For for to give benefit to the students, uh, we can ask two 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 diagnoses. So one will be achalasia cardia, then somebody can write lung abscess, and teacher may accept this diagnosis. So this depends on the uh, how the question is moderated. So mention two other investigation to establish the diagnosis. So if it is achalasia cardia. Then, if we uh, want two diagnosis, two, two investigations, that one should be barium sole esophagus, and next one will be upper GI endoscopy. Not, nothing else. And next question mentioned two treatment options for this case. So, treatment option one is balloon dilatation, and next one is operation. That means Heller's myotomy or Heller's operation. There is a, a division of mass I am not he, uh, doing here. If you say only myotomy, you will get a 0.5. If you write Heller's myotomy, you will get mass one. We will show in the letter, uh, next uh, slide, that how the mass are distributed and you have to answer accordingly. So we can move to second. You have seen this, uh, see, seen this one. Here, there, there are three questions during real hospice station. List four tests that you would suggest with urine sample, with this urine sample. That means you know, so many of you have written, I think. Can you can you say what, what was the diagnosis they have written in the oh you have not seen, you have not seen. Okay. 
So, so many you have, you have, you have um, 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 written as a calorie. You see, this is a, huh? this is a uh, 45 years old man having this leg swelling. You, may, you see, this leg swelling and this urine. So, this is can be a elephantasis or phylosis because this is the most important cause of, there are so many cause of urinary leg swelling. You can see DBT, but DBT cannot produce this source of urine. You can see uh, cellulitis. But these cellulites cannot uh, produce this source of urine. So if you think caloria, you should think this is a phylogenesis. Or if elephant is, uh, it is not so much extensive. You cannot say elephant is, but you should say limbenzitis or in like edema. So this is phylogenesis. So depending on this phylogenesis and caloria, uh, you will start let investor. But this question is the pattern is you see the pattern. List the four tests that you would suggest with the urine sample. That means you have been asked, you have been asked to differentiate this, uh, this, uh, this color of the urine. Uh, there can be one question, tell the different dynamics of this urine sample. That means it can be caloria, it can be pus, it can be phosphate, it can be, uh, these three important, caloria, phosphate, and pus. So with this urine sample, First, you should identify whether this is a this is a caloria or which is the most likely dynamic. So first should be ether test. It has a solvent, it dissolves the chyle. So if you put ether, if it dissolves, there is more, more definite that it is a caloria. It is very easy to test in the world. Next, you can do if you if you think phosphate, you can add 1% acetic acid, 10% acetic acid. If it phosphate, hyperphosphatemia, it, it will be dissolved, so it will be hyperphosphatemia. If you think this is a pus, pyuria, then you can see even for RME, pus for fast cell. And you can uh, identify the fat globules uh, by uh, Sudan Black, Sudan 3 test. There are so many tests with the Sudan 3. I'm not going to detail. And you can uh, estimate even triglyceride or calomacrine if it is possible. This is uh, uh, positive in case of caloria, but very simple test is a test. And fiber investigation that may be necessary for this person as a whole investor. That means that means investor for fibria. Routine test CBC is will count. Chest test may be a routine test, but this is the most important fibrinal serology, CFT or ICT or ELISA. Student may write anyone, they will take uh, get the marks. Uh, Microfilarial detection. If you think DDMR, you have to exclude DDMR, uh, DBT, then you can DBT. To exclude DBT, you should uh, do duplex study. And for, uh, for, for, see the source of caloria, you can see other investigation like abnormal sonography or CTOGram or MRI. This is the same idea of see the structural change of the a uh, 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 system. So this will take, uh, this will be in one group. And the limb or limb will be, will demonstrate the actual fistula or communication within the limbic channel and it will tract. And you can, we can do endoscopy like cyst electroscopy or retrograde pyrography, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the answer scheme. You see, you have been asked to write five answers. We have given nine, so you have got option. If we if we if we see that your five answers will be within this, then you will get mark. Then outline three principles of management of the case in dignity. Principle: first of all, you have to take the limb care, either DBT or infant. You have to take the limb care. You have to give drug therapy. These the, the principles. So drug therapy. There is dialogarbazine, olmectin, albendazole, doxerine, penicillin. You have to give some dietary advice to take medium chain triglyceride. And coconut oil is a very good source of medium chain triglyceride. And, uh, and ultimately, if it does not work, we can go for surgical, minor surgery, that is called therapy with 1% silver nitrate, or ultimately reconstruction surgery that is plastic surgery. So in this way, we put the question, we expect answer in this way, and this is the structure of marking. This is the ECG. 
this is the first question was mentioned the impotency findings. I have asked you to see, tell the diagnosis because of further time, but in OSCE, as there is five minutes, so you should write the diagnosis uh, findings. So there's a still emission in two, three ABF, and there is marking 1.5 point five for each. So 1.5 will get. And there is also a still emission in uh, B1, in B1 and B2. B1 and B2, B1 and B2, and reciprocal acid depression in one EBL B6. So these are the findings. And name two are the most urgent investigation in the next step. Urgent means urgent. So as there is, uh, there is, there is right ventricular infection, evidence of right ventricular infection, because there is patient uh, presented with shock, and there is right ventricular infection. So standard thing is in case of right ventricular infection. If the patient is shock or low blood pressure, you should consider right ventricular infection. Moreover, there is estillation in V1, uh, V2. It also signifies right ventricular infection. So next investment will be uh, ECG with right ventricular leads. That means you can write right ventricular leads. You can uh, write V3R or V4R. You can write right write chest lead. Whatever you write, you get, you get the same, same question. And of course, as this is MI, next, uh, next will be to buy or cardiac enzyme. If you write specific to pi, you will get one month. If you write back, ill-defined answer, cardiac enzyme, you will get less month. Right? Three important physical signs that you should look for in this case. There is a triad of low blood pressure hypertension, there is red JBP, and lungs will be clear. There is a triad of right ventral infection, you know. And there is a tricky question. Name two drugs that are contraindicated in this patient. Without asking how you manage the, how may manage the case, we have put the such a question so that the student should think. So usually there is follow blood pressure. So nitrate, only nitrate is the contraindicated. And these all are contraindicated. Nitrates, beta blocker, AC inhibitor, diuretics, all are contraindicated. But most importantly, nitrates. If you write these two, you will get full marks, two and two and five. But if you write diuretics and AC inhibitor, you will get one marks. You see how we distribute the marking depending on the uh, nature of the question and, and uh, expected uh, correct answer. We, we distribute the marks in this way. So be careful of writing answer, answer. Though the answer is very short, but it carries much mark. So uh, this is, this is uh, MRCP. What are the MRCP findings? The detailed finding, I'm not going in detail. There are uh, signal void areas. That is actually a feeling defect. But MRCB, the term is single signal void areas in CBD, in uh, intermediate ducts, and cystic, cystic, cystic ducts. And signal void area. Single void area in the gallbladder also. Gallbladder also. And gallbladder is dilated also. So what is the clinical diagnosis? So clinical diagnosis is called cholelithiasis with cholelithiasis with cholelithiasis. And name one important abnormal clinical sign for this case during the day. As there is double infection in the cystic duct and the common bile duct, so gallbladder will be enlarged. So in this case, the gallbladder will be pulvered. There are two or three uh, three reasons for palpable gallbladder. See, one of those is, is double impaction by stones, palpable gallbladder. So what is the definite treatment option? ERCB guided stone removal followed by laparoscopy colostomy. Two, one is stone removal followed by colostomy. If you write this complete answer, you will get two. So this is the marking scheme. So these are ABC. Uh, this is the diet question. What is the acid-based disorder, but our question was, our question was parameter. So you, you, you see, pH is low, carbonate is high, bicarbonate is uh, low, and, uh, and and then gap is high. So there are so many parameters, but if we, if I wanted four, so this, this will be the four parameters. So what is the acid-based disorder? So this is the combined, or you can say mixed, respiratory and metabolic acidosis. There is no question of compensation. I think you know what is the uh, formula for compensation. Uh, so 
this formula does not work here because, because the pH is so low, carbon is so high, carbon is so high, it is obvious that there is mixed respiratory and metabolic acid is here. So next question, this is a record type of question, explain four possible causes of the metabolic abnormality in this patient. Four causes means pathophysiological cause actually we wanted. Septic shock, infectic exhaustion, CBD or pneumonia, acute kidney injury, and diabetic kidney diseases. And this is our record type of question. Mention six immediate management protocol for this patient. That is one should be oxygen, though oxygen in CPD, uh, oxygen is given in a controlled way. Diabetes for insulin, IV fluid, iotrops, antibiotic. You should not write detail because question is six immediate management protocol or option. So it, you can write that simply protocols options. This is MRI brain. Uh, this is a, you see, I'm going straight to the answer. You see, this image was taken at emergency. Email, emergency, emergency. So there is a uh, hyperindicent oxygen uh, low, both, both, both sides. And you see, there is no this has lesion. So there is a resolution of the hypertensity of the previous lesion. So you see the structure, you see that, you see, if you see on both sides, you will get one. You see, if you write occipital lesion, you get, get one. And for hyperintensity, three, one, so total three. So if you, you should write the uh, actual finding in detail. And uh, what is the possible diagnosis? So it is easy. If you understand the findings, it's easy. That is press. That is posterior reversible and cephalopathy syndrome. This is for obvious from the scenario also. This is emergency. That's what eclampsia. The high blood pressure. So this is emergency. So in this situation, uh, the actually uh, press uh, press uh, uh, occurs. Actually, there, there is I think there is one S. Sorry, and there is another name: reversible posterior liquid cephalopathy syndrome (RPL) same. And this, this is a recordable question. List four conditions that will be associated with this, with this, uh, with this, with, the, with this condition. You see, renal failure, CKD, and AKI, AKI. If you write one renal failure, two CKD, third AKI, this will not be considered three cause, three cause, because they, these are of same, same pattern. So, so autoimmune disorder. If you write one RA, one SLE, one Dogren, you should not think that this is. A three answers. So in this way, we actually start. So this is one group, one group, whatever you write. If you write autoimmune disease, you will make, get mark. If you write RA, you will get mark. If you write SLE, you will get mark. Or if you write in this way, you will get mark. But if you write one RA, second SLE, second pen, you will not get three mark for three. So this is how we, um, how we uh, teach the student and how we uh, orient the students. And I think, we you should also write in this way. And this is seven spirometry. What is the spirometry diagnosis? Uh, this is actually see if you see uh, this also, there is a, a severe obstruction. If you see the ratio, the severe obstruction and this is reversible. And this is reversible. As there is severe obstruction and there is reversible, fully reversible, there are some differences of reversible. I think it, it, it fills with the reversal definition. So this is bronchial asthma. Bronchial asthma and, and three measures that you would suggest to improve his fitness for anesthesia. That you should, that means you should treat him as a asthma. First of all, you should uh, lava, and then you can uh, give, uh, give the uh, salbutamol, and third, steroid inhaler, and third, uh, and the only drug is, it is called, this is obviously this is controversial. But I have put, put it here, this is controversial for uh, asthma. But as there is chronic asthma, I think you can write this also. And this record type of question this patient ha was happened to be smoker. Mention four principles of smoking cessation. This is from depression. And this is uh, eight, very minima. Relative findings you see. This is ascending colon. So there is irregular filling defect in the ascending colon, and there is shouldering effect. This is called, you see, this is called shouldering effect. If you see earlier, you can diagnose. If you see, do not 
uh, see these sorts of image in the in, in previous previously you cannot diagnose the case so this is a colonic neoplasm or carcinoma of colon whatever you write you will get the answer and wh how the patient may present so there are so many presentation but most common present are un unexplained anemia weight loss abnormal mass irregular bowel weight etc and next approach that uh, next approval investigation the only one investigation that is colonoscopy and biopsy and histology. You see, if you write only colonoscopy, this will not get a full mark. You should write colonoscopy, you will do bi biopsy, follow the histology. This is the station, uh, this is the station nine city head. You see, describe the abnormal findings in the image. You see a hypotense area in the right frontal, right frontal and parietal lobes. If it's part of the right lateral ventricle, you see no lateral ventricle, and midline shifting to, uh, to the midline shifting to the left. So lesion is right side, shifting on the left side, towards left side. You see. What with the uh, which cerebellary territory is involved? This is a large area of involvement. So the whole right internal carotid has been involved. That means middle cerebral artery plus anterior cerebral artery. If you write right coronary artery, this is correct. If you write middle cerebral artery plus anterior carotid artery, this is also right. But if you write only middle cerebral artery, you will not get full marks. You will get 0.5 marks. Another tricky question. Uh, what will be the state of speech if the patient survives? You see, the patient was right handed. So, mind that. So, you should uh, consider every uh, wording of the question. He is right handed. So, his broca area on the left side, lesion on the right side. So, his broca area has not been affected. So, his speech will, will be unaffected if the patient, of course, survives. Others are record every question for investigation to assess the risk factor in this case. So this is the four, you have, uh, I have put in five, uh, among the five, you can write four, it will be correct. And how will you address hypertension in this case? This is also a tricky question. This is the most practical question. As this is acute condition, and the blood pressure is not so high, so no end is needed immediately. Or you can write, I will follow up without starting end at this moment. But but there are some condition in which endometrial drug should be started. Jamon, so for example, heart failure, renal failure, every dissection, and if there is hypertension ansiability, in this acute condition we should start endometrial. But in this condition, in this scenario, I think answer should be there is no endometrial medication at this moment immediately, and we can follow up. Uh, if necessary, we can give later on, not even now. I think this is the uh, last, uh, last city, last, last station. And I think I'm uh, on time. Okay, this is a uh, mention the abnormality in the in the graph. You see, uh, usually we uh, uh, we uh, we put this report as a gamma globulin increased, but here gamma is normal. You see, this is beta two globulin. Beta to globulin, uh, beta to globulin in anti myeloma, beta to globulin also rises. So, abnormal findings in the graph is monoclonal protein, of course, monoclonal, M protein, or increased beta to globulin. Whatever you write of the three, you will get the full marks. And list three other investigation diagnostic test to confirm diagnosis. And this is almost from the deviation, that is bone marrow examination, unit benzos protein, excess scalar, sur scalar survey, immune filtration, or immune electrophoresis. So, out of four, you can write three. You will get the full marks. Then name five predictors of poor prognosis in this condition. These, of course, from uh, book. So this is a record type. I think you all know. We have put many, many, many of them, and we will see whether you write five from this, uh, this uh, nine or ten. This is a clinical question. This patient present with a confusion state with polyuria and polyripsia. Serum calcium level was 50 milligram. Outline five basic principles of management. Of this condition, that means hypercalcemia management of severe hypercalcemia. This is also a recurrent question. The answer is from the book. 
uh, but you should write very um, uh, briefly. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, is, there is six or seven option. We will see whether you have right real five option. So I think I, I am on time. I uh, like to thank the organizer to allow me to talk on OSPI, though this is not a real OSPI. And um, now I will hand over the mic to, to whom? Professor Nandini? Uh, I'll be taking over. Okay, thank you. So over to uh, you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Professor Jolil Choudhury for this wonderful class, because uh, this thing is new to us, though OSPI has been in the curriculum for quite a few years. But uh, such a class in the virtual platform, uh, I do not think I have come across. And this, this will start the ball rolling. And I'm sure the students have got an idea how to approach uh, the questions uh, and how mass distribution. Also, a very important aspect you have touched upon is that you have given them an idea how the marks are distributed in these questions, how they need to. This is an eye opener of sorts. And I thank you very much for your valuable time. And now uh, we move on to the uh, next, uh, next uh, part of our class, which is also a very interesting case to be discussed uh, by our uh, esteemed Professor Namal Vijayasinghe as well as Dr. Kitmini Elepule. Professor Namal is a professor of medicine of General Sir John Kotelawala University of Sri Lanka. And he will be discussing the case along with uh, his senior registrar in internal medicine, Dr. Kitmini. And without, uh, uh, without much ado, I invite Professor Namal and Dr. Kitmini to start their class and we can all delve into another aspect of internal medicine. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, uh, I must thank uh, the organizers of uh, Global Forum, especially Professor Nandini Chatterjee. During the last uh, few days, uh, she worked really hard to organize this and make this presentation a reality. And uh, all the members of Global Forum, and also I, I thank uh, Dr. Kumudini Jayasing, our own uh, president of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to do the presentation today. Uh, together with me, uh, we have uh, Dr. Kitni Ellipola, a promising uh, young physician. She's a senior registrar and very soon she'll be board certified as a, as a, a very uh, good uh, physician and specialist in internal medicine. So I'll first uh, invite uh, Kitmini to present the case today. Kitmini, over to you. Could you uh, share the slides and start the presentation, please? Yes. Yes. Uh, as as she is uh, sharing the slide, I will just outline how we will go about this. She will be presenting the uh, slides and start the clinical presentation. And then there will be uh, some questions which Professor Namal will be first asking her and then discuss it. And we have Professor Arun Maske with us as well as Professor Ganaka Senaratne, who is the past president of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine as well, and Dr. Palani Appan, who is the vice president of API. He has still not joined. I'll try to contact him. So uh, the uh, discussion of the case will also involve some questioning and answers and expert opinions as well. So Kitmini, it's over to you. Please start. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Kitmini Alipur, and together with Professor Nama Vijay Singh, we are going to do a case based discussion on heart failure based on a patient who presented to us with acute onset dyspnea. So, our patient is Mr. CP, a 62 year old the diagnosed patient with diabetes mellitus for more than 10 years with both macrovascular and microvascular complications and hypertension for more than five years and ischemic heart disease. However, he has devoted follow up for one year. He presented to us with a history of gradually progressive shortness of breath of NYHA class 2 for two weeks, which frequently have exacerbated to a shortness of breath of NYHA class 4 over two days. And in addition, he had bilateral lobe spreading for two days. 
So he complained that this exertion of this knee of a YHA class two, which has persisted for two weeks, has recently exacerbated to a shortness of breath of and YHA class four. It has been associated with orthopnea, but it now is occurring paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. In addition, there has been bilateral nodal swelling as well for the past two weeks, but in light of any periorbital swelling or significant abdominal swelling, there was also no chest pain, palpitations, cough, wheezing, fever, sputum expectoration, or hemoptysis. There was also no oliguria or hematuria. So, upon examination, the patient was dysmic, tachypnic, with a saturation of 76 on room milk. There was significant bilateral pitting type of edema in the joint level, and he was tachycardic with a pulse rate of 110. The blood pressure was significantly low with a reading of 80 by 50 millimeters mercury. The JVP was elevated and the FX was shifted to left sixth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line. Upon auscultation, there was a gallop rhythm and five end inspiratory crepitations could be heard over bilateral lung fields up to mid source. So after the history and the examination findings, we came to a diagnosis of acutely decompensated heart failure with cardiogenic shock. And without much delay, the patient was taken to the high dependency unit and was attached to a cardiac monitor. He was given high flow oxygen via a face mask and two white book annual level inserted. Blood was taken for full blood count, cardiac markers like troponin I, renal and liver function tests. Since the IVC was fully dilated, the patient was started on adrenaline infusion at a rate of 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute infusion. And an immediate ECG, which was taken, showed sign of tachycardia with poor R rate rotation, and he was catheterized simultaneously. Uh, so the blood pressure, pulse rate, and saturations were monitored continuously. And once the systolic blood pressure was more than 100 millimeters mercury, a brusimide infusion was started at a rate of 5 milligrams per hour. And once the patient was stable, the infusion was later converted to a regular dose of cruzamide. And once the patient was stable enough, a repeat 2D echo was performed, which showed the evidence of global hypokinesia with an ejection fraction of 30%. Throughout this period, the patient was on DVD prophylaxis with subcutaneous and ensoparin, 40 mg daily. And upon discharge, the patient was thoroughly educated about the importance of compliance of the drugs, and the drug regime is optimized. He was later discharged on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and beta blocker, and an aldosterone antagonist and SGLT2 inhibitor, and of course, a diuretic for symptomatic benefit. So, the rest of the presentation will be carried out by Professor Nama and Jaisinghe. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Kidmini. Uh, now, as you heard, this patient presented with uh, uh, acute onset shortness of breath, although the, the symptoms were going on for uh, two week, uh, weeks, uh, the last few couple of days and hours, uh, she, uh, the patient has got worsened and yes. presented with a severe shortness of breath and profound hypotension. So uh, now what we need to understand here is acute heart failure is a, a term coined to describe many uh, presentations. Uh, you can have uh, uh, decompensated uh, acute decompensation of chronic heart failure. You can have de, de novo uh, heart failure, like three th uh, two thirds of the cases are decompensated chronic heart failure. The patients who know uh, to have, uh, they are known to have heart failure. Uh, and also other uh, ones like right heart failure, uh, flash pulmonary edema, uh, also high output cardiac failure, hypertensive crisis. All these patients can present as acute heart failure. So our patient is a patient who was known to have uh, heart failure. I was not sure about the compliance of the medications because uh, he was lost to follow up for one, one year. And, and uh, to add to that and to complicate the, the presentation, patient was having uh, severe hypotension. So this is a, a mixed presentation. He was having acutely decompensated heart failure plus the cardiogenic shock. As you can see in this uh, slide, these are different uh, presentations. It is important to identify uh, the, the correct presentation because the management vary depending on the presentation. Uh, so let's uh, talk about uh, uh, these uh, presentations uh, during the discussion. Uh, next slide, uh, Kitmini. Uh, okay, uh, first, uh, we will discuss how we can confirm the diagnosis. 
of heart failure, which is very important because the patients with acute shortness of breath can be due to main, many causes. It could be acute heart failure, decompensation of heart failure, as well as uh, deterioration of asthma, uh, exacerbation of COPD, uh, could be pulmonary embolism, um, chest infections like pneumonia, uh, pneumothoraces. So different. So first we need to confirm the diagnosis of acute heart failure. Uh, Kirmini, could you tell us how would you uh, diagnose uh, in the emergency department? Well, actually, from first from the history and the examination of the patient, and then we can do a bedside echocardiogram if the facilities are available. And of course, with the bedside ultrasound scan to see that there is a buccal file. And if the patient is uh, stable enough to be sent to a chest X-ray, we can see that there is a cardiomegaly in the chest X-ray, so that we can get an idea about that. From the echocardiogram, what they would be seeing would be a left ventricular or right ventricular contractility and to see the reduced ejection fractions. Yeah, good. Now, we have some basic investigations to do, like the ECG, where you can look at evidence of ischemia, acute MI, and uh, arrhythmias that has uh, caused uh, the decompensation. Uh, of course, the pulse approximate will guide us on a oxygen therapy. Uh, Blood, I mean, you have to uh, insert a couple of annually and take blood for investigation. The important ones are the blood blood count, the, the, the renal functions, electrolytes, and you know, all the cardiac uh, enzymes. Um, now, chest X ray and ultrasound uh, uh, scans to me are the most important investigations to do in our settings. However, if you look at the guidelines, uh, they are talking about the BNP. Uh, if you go, go to the previous slide, uh, Kidmini, again, now you can see here, uh, to confirm the diagnosis, what is recommended nowadays, uh, according to ESE guidelines, is the, the BNP, the BNP uh, more than 100, or uh, pro-BNP more than 300 uh, picograms per milliliter, will confirm the diagnosis, and also we can use it to exclude the diagnosis of heart failure. However, the issue is, uh, at least in Sri Lanka, I, I don't know about uh, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and, and Bangladesh. Uh, we don't have that facility uh, in all the places. And also, it is very, at least in the public uh, hospitals, and, and even in the public, uh, the private sector, it is very expensive. So, uh, if you have that facility, especially point of care, a BNP, that would be very helpful to either diagnosis or exclude heart failure in this setting. But uh, what we have uh, in the emergency department is the chest X-ray and also the lung ultrasound scan, which are, if you have the facility, uh, the, it's not expensive. And quickly, we can do the diagnosis. So next slide, uh, Kidmini, as uh, you, we saw, uh, you can see the chest X-ray. Uh, as Kidmini said, you can look for the cardiomegaly. This particular patient didn't have cardiomegaly, but uh, you usually have cardiomegaly and also this roughly shadowing, typical of uh, severe pulmonary edema and, and curly B lines, and some people will have uh, obliteration of postrovenic angles as well. So, chest x ray is very helpful, but what is even faster uh, than uh, chest x ray is the lung ultrasound scan because uh, lung ultrasound, the ultrasound machines are available now in many uh, emergency departments. And if you know how to do it, uh, you can quickly do a lung ultrasound scan and, and look for evidence of pulmonary edema. At this point, I will uh, invite uh, our uh, immediate past president, Dr. Ganaka Senaradna. I think he has joined uh, because he's uh, one of the leading people in doing uh, point of ultrasound, uh, point of care ultrasound scanning uh, teaching programs in, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, so, Ganaka, if you are there, could you please uh, uh, explain to us how important is lung ultrasound scan here? Yeah, um, thank you, Namal. I uh, hope uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, thanks, Nandini and Jyoti and all. Uh, thank, uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you. So, lung ultrasound is a very, very important uh, technique in uh, assessing acute shortness of breath. What we do is a blue protocol. And uh, as you can see in this uh, picture, if you uh, scan the lungs by using the uh, curvilinear probe, 
you can see uh, the soft tissue and then the uh, prominent white line which represent the pleura and then uh, you can see some uh, lines coming down from the pleura that's called uh, b lines that's actually all these are artifacts so this is called common tail artifact these uh, vertical lines you can see if you have three or more of them in one window it's said to be abnormal so these b lines uh, we call them b lines uh, these b lines represent some uh, it's represent uh, interstitial syndrome in the lung so it could be fluid it could be inflammatory exudate or it could be uh, fibrous tissue even and so but with the clinical history acute shortness of breath uh, chest pain uh, previous ischemic heart disease person you do, do ultrasound scan of the chest to see uh, b lines symmetrically distributed either side will make you to think that that is none other than fluid in case of uh, exudation in case of uh, infection it will be asymmetrically distributed and fibrosis of course you know it's a chronic uh, sob and uh, uh, we wouldn't uh, we can easily differentiate fibrosis from fluid from the history so this is very um, uh, easy technique and uh, readily available and the people can be trained uh, without much problem as well. So I, I believe uh, the lung ultrasound is very, very uh, easy tool to uh, handle and very uh, productive technique to diagnose uh, pulmonary edema and interstitial uh, pulmonary syndromes. Um, have I uh, answered your question, uh, Namal? Is that Anything yeah, you want? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ganaka. I think uh, you did the, the, the justice to my question. And, and also to exclude uh, um, other causes of shortness of breath, uh, isn't there? like uh, pneumothoraces uh, and uh, plural, big plural effusions, all can be seen. Uh, so uh, our message is for the trainees uh, uh, to learn a point of care ultrasound sonography, because that is an important tool that you can handle uh, in the emergency setting. So we'll go to the next. Thank you so much, Ganakar, uh, for your contribution. Uh, uh, next slide. And uh, also, Kitmini mentioned about echocardiography. If you have echocardiography, that is all, again a part of uh, point of care ultrasonography. You don't have to have an echo machine. Uh, even with a curvilinear probe, you can do a, a echocardiography in the emergency department. But uh, if you have an echo probe, that will be handy. Uh, look and look at the size of the cardiac chambers, uh, contractility, I can measure EF, uh, wall motion abnormality, our patient had global hypokinesia, some people have regional wall motion abnormality, um, any gross valvular pathology like, uh, like mitral aortic regurgitation, severe critical aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, all these can be found out. And, and uh, some people can, I mean, although it's a little difficult in the emergency department, we can assist the diastolic dysfunction. And, and uh, we can exclude large vertical effusion, tamponade, and also mechanical causes with uh, acute myocardial infarction. People can present with acute uh, mitral regurgitation, acute PSD, and straight away they can go into they will go into cardiogenic shock. All can be found out in the echocardiography. However, one thing I want to uh, mention here is that it is not a like a, a test to exclude or confirm diagnosis. It is only helpful information because uh, some maybe there is a patient with ejection fraction of 30%. They can present with another cause of shortness of breath, like pulmonary embolism or chest infection. So just because the patient has an ejection fraction of 30% doesn't mean that the cause for this presentation is heart failure. Therefore, as I said, the most important test to diagnose are either chest X-ray or the BNP or the lung ultrasound scan. Echocardiography will help us to find out the background information about the cardiac function, and that will help, as I mentioned here. Okay, next uh, slide, uh, Kidmin. Okay. What are the etiological factors for acute decompensation? Now, this patient, what do you think, uh, Kidmini? What has caused the decompensation? Uh, this patient has reported for the work for one year, sir, so there's poor compliance to drug, so that would be the prime cause in these patients, but I would like to exclude acute coronary syndrome and 
infections which can precipitate acute heart failure in uh, patients. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we'll go to the next slide. I will show you. Yeah, as we said, you know, the poor compliance uh, to medications is one of the common causes and sold load. And for various reason, if they have eaten uh, lately eaten uh, uh, food uh, with high salt, that can uh, trip the balance and uh, put the patient in decompensation. But uh, the mnemonic to remember is the champ it, uh, which is also mentioned in the uh, the AC guidelines as uh, the acute coronary syndrome like myocardial infarction, ST elevation, non-ST elevation, hypertensive crisis or hypertensive emergencies, arrhythmias. Mechanical causes, as I mentioned, acute MR, acute VSD, pulmonary embolism, infection, and tamponade. So these are the, the common causes that you should look into uh, in, in your investigations. ECG is helpful, echocardiography is helpful, uh, chest X-ray is helpful, and you look for these uh, etiological factors that has caused the decompensation of heart failure. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Let's talk about oxygen and the ventilator support. Uh, now you said uh, you gave oxygen, uh, and and at, when when the the blood pressures are low, we don't normally put them on CPAP because the, that will further uh, cause like will worsen the hy hypotension. Now, how do you give oxygen to this patient and? and uh, we can have high flow oxygen while face mask because the saturation is less than ninety percent. So we can see with high flow oxygen for a face mask to see whether she improves or not. If it's not improving, then he needs some inverse ventilation or inverse ventilation. Yeah, now uh, my uh, mind goes back to uh, uh, like uh, the senior consultants here in all the countries will remember when we were medical students and junior doctors, we used to give oxygen to everyone. Uh, but uh, now, at least according to guidelines, uh, Oxygen is not indicated uh, for all the patients with heart failure. Oxygen is given only when the saturation is less than 90% or the partial pressure of oxygen is less than 60 millimeters mercury because oxygen is also a potent vasoconstrictor that might aggravate the myocardial ischemia. So uh, remember all the trainees, uh, saturation, uh, unless the saturation is low, uh, we don't have to give them oxygen. And initially we can start with the face mask and 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 by really the mask, uh, but if you can't maintain oxygen just by a face mask, then we need to con or else if you can see signs of uh, uh, respiratory distress like the, the respiratory is more than twenty five or so, and we can't maintain the saturation by giving oxygen, then we should consider non invasive uh, ventilation. Actually, this has revolutionized the management of acute heart failure. Uh, before the in terms of CPAP, we had nothing much to do unless we give oxygen and fusamide, nitrate infusion, and all, then, then to start praying uh, to uh, get some good result. But CPAP has revolutionized, uh, so uh, use them early. As soon as you know that the patient is in distress, then you can get better results. However, failing all that, if the patient is further deteriorating, you can't maintain ox oxygenation, then we need to take a decision whether to intubate and bring the patient to a ventilator and, and know the indications of oxygen therapy, know the indications of non-invasive ventilation and, 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 and know the indications and, and when to intubate and ventilate these patients. Okay, thank you. Shall we go to the next? Anyone can uh, actually comment. If you uh, have a different opinions, uh, please go ahead. Uh, we will have a discussion. What is the indication for intravenous morphine, Kismini, for this patient? Have you given or not? So we haven't given morphine. So usually it's recommended only if the patient is having intractable pain or if the patient is anxious. So we would give morphine in our setting. Yes. Now, again, uh, uh, sometime back, uh, when we were young doctors, we used to give morphine for all the patients with heart failure because that will relieve the anxiety and also it is a, a, a potent venodilator. And uh, by uh, dilating veins, we could uh, uh, reduce the venous return and, and uh, get the heart to relax, uh, reduce the workload for the heart. However, now it's a class three recommendation. You know, the class three recommendations are actually 
uh, they are harmful. They are they are of no use. So now the the morphine is uh, or other opiates like fentanyl are recommended uh, uh, only when the patients have severe or intractable pain or anxiety. Otherwise, we shouldn't give. Yes, so let's sir. go to the next. Yeah. Yeah. One thing is that in any case, more morphine in India it is not available. Like All we right. do, in most setups, we don't get it. So, uh, what is what is the situation in Sri Lanka? Like, if you need it, do you get it? Yes, morphine? Yeah, we 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 have morphine available in the emergency departments and the boards, and okay. uh, we use we use it for pain management especially pain when management. the patients come with ST elevation myocardial infarction MIs. okay yeah what yes. is the opiate available in uh, in uh, india for pain management fentanyl tra tramadol all that but morphine okay. is not uh, not available okay in yeah in any case that? this is a very important message to all our students that from time immemorial we've been reading that morphine is to be given in acute heart failure but we must keep in mind that as sir has said that it is no longer a recommended and it is of class 3c yeah. yes please and, continue and, and, can, yeah, I, can and, i can i can i can i add something of course yes, of course yes sir. dr chaudhary yes uh, in in bangladesh the morphine is used uh, oral morphine is available for palliative care it is available in some specific centers. Yeah. Okay. Regarding uh, English, regarding English but, uh, we have a textbook teaching from our teachers that in a dying patient, you should not use morphine because in a dying patient, if you give morphine and the patient die of a disease, original disease, then the people surrounding you will consider that you have killed the person by giving morphine. So this is our <laughs> teaching. And, and there is, yeah, you have mentioned that uh, there is the use of morphine so you you should we should use uh, morphine cautiously in heart failures. Thank you, thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank morphine you is much. available yeah. in Nepal. Okay, oh, it is available, available in, Nepal. in Nepal. Yeah. So, uh, but one thing other I want to mention is okay. when there is intractable pain with myocardial infarction, don't let the patient suffer yeah. with pain, and and uh, and also usually the night tests don't work because this uh, pain yes, coming yeah, from often. necrotic necrotic uh, myo uh, myocardium. So uh, uh, please give morphine for myocardial infarction, but don't give morphine for acute heart failure. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, question, uh, Kidmini. Yes, yes. So what is the indication for inotropes in this patient? Now you use inotropes because of the low blood pressure. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, what this is patient's it? IBC was fully dilated, sir. So we didn't go ahead with the fluid challenge. So since the patient was fully overloaded, we straight away went ahead with point two micrograms per kilogram per meter in patients. Yeah. So you made an important point. Now, uh, like it will be scary to hear sometimes uh, that you give a fluid challenge to a patient with acute heart failure. But that is that is actually indicated. Um, even in the guideline is mentioned. Now uh, this slide I took straight away from the ESC guidelines. You can see that uh, if the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is less than 90 uh, and evidence of hypoperfusion, uh, you, you, you should do standard management of uh, hypotension, including a fluid challenge. But don't keep on giving large amount of fluid, but you can try a fluid challenge before you start inotropes. Because inotropes are generally discouraged because of the, the safety concerns, because there are side effects and so on, uh, potential to arrhythmias and so on. But uh, it has to be used. Uh, now, um, again, um, the, the strain is to know uh, different types of inotropes. There are inotropes with vasodilators like dobutamine. Uh, and also, in this case, because this patient had cardiogenic shock, the indication the, 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 the is for uh, noradrenaline because it's a vasopressor and that will uh, increase the blood pressure and also. Uh, maintain the, the tissue perfusion. So, so you can give a combination of dobutamine and um, noradrenaline, or you can start with no, noradrenaline in this patient. So, know the indication for inotropic agents, know the indication for vasopressors, suppressors, and don't afraid to give a fluid challenge um, if and when necessary, but do it cautiously. Thank you.
So let's go to the next question. Uh, sir, uh, just uh, in the question of inotropes, just one small query. Uh, noradrenaline is the drug of choice, of course, but uh, what, is the, what is the position of dobutamine and dopamine? What are they now considered? Yeah, no. Where actually, do they lie uh, for, in the position of management of acute heart failure? Yeah, acute heart failure with uh, like without uh, cardiogenic shock with the marginal blood pressures, we can use uh, dobutamine because that is actually uh, better because it's a vasodilator. Uh, so you can increase the blood pressure, but uh, but with profound cardiogenic shock. Uh, that will further worsen the, the blood pressure. Therefore, uh, noradrenaline is the drug of choice. Uh, when you keep, uh, like, you know, many patients come with uh, decompensated heart failure without cardiogenic shock, for them, uh, in selected patients, the butamine infusions are beneficial. Professor Maske, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, what, what, uh, what is the, uh, how do you, uh, comment on this so first question is this patient in acute pulmonary edema or cardiogenic shock that's first question so and if you look at that uh yeah as, as i mentioned at uh, the beginning as i mentioned at the beginning patient because sometimes when the patients are having a decompensated heart failure with, with pulmonary edema they also go into uh they can also go into cardiogenic shock as you remember we, we call, talk about warm and wet, warm and dry and, and so on. So this patient was cold and wet. So uh, this patient had pulmonary edema as well as uh, cardiogenic shock. That was the management issue. Here this management was complicated by patient going into cardiogenic shock. Well, the other so question is, if you look at that X-ray of the patient with the ejection fraction 30% and the chest X-ray is almost normal, so how do you explain this to this patient? Yeah, as I mentioned, we would expect the heart to be uh, large, uh, like uh, there's significant cardiomegaly, but uh, I mean, this was the x-ray that we, we got. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, pulmonary edema, pulmon yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, but... but the so the other question is... What happened to that ejection fraction after this patient is stabilized before discharge? Is it 30% or is it uh, improved? You mean uh, after ejection the treatment? Fraction. Yeah. After the treatment? So, yeah, after I, the patient actually, was stabilized. Yeah, I actually don't know. I mean, uh, I would expect it to be improved uh, slightly because when the patient go into uh, acute heart failure, there is also myocardial stunning. So the high ejection fraction go down slightly. However, I don't know whether you remember this famous graph. With each episode of decompensation, the, the baseline ejection fraction deteriorates. So uh, uh, with good treatment, I expect it to improve a bit. And what was the cause of a uh, patient going into acute pulmonary in this patient? I, I would expect it to be uh, poor compliance, but uh, I don't think uh, there was, I think they had done uh, ECGs and all, there was no acute coronary syndrome here, uh, but... Uh, no, but they have but, said uh, uh, ischemic heart disease in the slide. What is that? Uh, can you so show... He's a diabetic for patient? a long time, so yeah, this, he may yeah, be but, having so, a ischemic Yeah, this patient was having diabetes uh, with complications for with long all time. all complications with it. of ischemic yes. heart disease. So I would expect uh, him to have ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and uh, that could have caused the, the, the ejection fraction to be 30%. And uh, this event... Whether there put, was any infection yeah. that had precipitated that yeah. heart failure. Anything, anything could, could be possible. Yes. Yes. So. Other thing, I would be happy... See, this is a very important clinical diagnosis. If you look at the chest x-ray, there's a bad thing. And once you give diuretics and stabilize patient, it the me, next day... Could you just go back to the slide of chest x-ray just for discussion? And then did you do the, did you do the repeat x-ray? 
that would be a fantastic tool for a learning case. Patient yeah, coming I, with this, but, we are but, confused but, with the but, but pneumonia. You this, they, but you, so that's very quite, a bit side. Quite right, uh, Dr. Maki. And uh, uh, after the, uh, the next day or so, we should repeat the x-ray. And uh, there will be a drastic improvement in the x-ray. Yes. If it is pulmonary edema. And if there is any uh, mask infection or... Uh, it will not go up. Be, yes, yeah, this uh, is a very important, and important yeah. message. Uh, that all these yeah. shadows once will the, disappear. Once the acute yeah. problem is over, like the next day or so, we should repeat the x-ray and compare it. Yes. Yes. yes Shall we move on now? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. I think uh, Ganaka wants to uh, say okay. something. Ganaka, oh, okay. I... ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Normal. Yeah. The, the, for the question of chest x-ray, yeah, I really respect that we should yes, do yes. that. But uh, since the presence of ultrasound scanner, we tend to use that more often than the X-rays now. Yes. Use, okay. you, you scan it and see whether your B lines have disappeared or not. That's what we do. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So uh, we'll move on with the slides, uh, Kidmini. Uh, time is running up. No, okay. sir. You take you take your time. Like uh, it's uh, it's not that we have to finish now, on the. Uh, we have, uh, as uh, mentioned, we have started orthopesis. Later on, we have given uh, uh, crucemide. Now, one other important thing I want to mention is if the patients are okay, uh, I don't know, in other countries are safe, there is a tendency nowadays to give start crucemide infusion. But in the acute setting, what is required is to give a bolus of crucemide. Because yeah. you just imagine starting 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams per hour, it will take one hour to uh, give uh, 10 milligrams of crucemide. So you have to start with a bolus. And if necessary, you can follow that up with an infusion. But in many cases, you can give boluses and manage these patients. Right? So uh, like, so I uh, just another point. Uh, my question here is, what are the medications proven to prolong the survival of this patient? So those are the things that we should be keen on giving. Uh, yeah, Kidmini? So we can use angiotensin receptor blockers or angio uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, beta blockers, SGLT2 inhibitors, arnies, if, uh, and evaporating. Those are the uh, drugs that they can use, uh, but most of the drugs... The could slide, be slide is not moving. Receptor, so the, yeah. Can you go to the next... Uh, slide. Slide. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you are right. Uh, and, uh, as as uh, you mentioned, now nowadays we talk about four pillars of heart failure management, four pillars. Those are the ACE inhibitors, ARBs and ANIs, one pillar, beta blockers, another pillar, MRAs, like aldosterone antagonists and another MRAs, another pillar, and also SGLT2 inhibitors, the other pillar. So we should try our best, unless there is a contraindication or intolerability, to give the maximum tolerable or maximum recommended dose of these medicines. And that is one of the ways of prolonging the survival of these patients. There are other, other ways as well, like uh, resynchronization re therapy, uh, that I'm not going to discuss here. But at least uh, for our uh, medical management perspective, these four pillars are important. Uh, so, and also in addition to that, we can, we can give there as evidence of giving a burden as well. However, out of the, me the medicines mentioned here, what is the medicine that can be started first? Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors can be started first, sir, because the other uh, drugs have a tendency to lower the blood pressure. So uh, in the acute setting, we couldn't start uh, the other drugs in this patient. Yeah, uh, the, the, the problem here is the low blood pressure. So we can't start AC inhibitors, ARB, so ANIS, uh, beta blockers, uh, can't be started. Uh, very small dose of uh, uh, phylonectone will not do any harm. But the best drug to be started here is the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, remember, even in a patient with cardiogenic shock, you can start SGLT2 inhibitors. Right? Now, there are some trial evidence. Impulse trial, I'm sure you, you have heard. Uh, Empaglifosin has been tested in patients with acute heart failure and shown some evidence, as you can see here. Um, go to the next slide. It's been tested with a, with a placebo, uh, against a placebo, and 
Emperor Everything was built tolerated uh, during acute heart failure. Uh, and uh, in, in acute heart failure due to both uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction and, uh, and uh, preserved ejection fraction. And there was a clinical benefit. Right? And go to the next slide, which is a very important slide that we all should remember. There are different presentations with patients. Patients with heart failure can present with low blood pressure and uh, normal or high heart rate, low blood pressure with low heart rate, uh, normal blood pressure with low heart rate. Likewise, patients atrial fibrillation they can have. So, so in all the patients, we can start SGLT2 inhibitor without any any issue. Uh, but other uh, med, uh, medicines like the other pillars, we have we can start only in a selected type of patients, low blood pressure patients, we can't start AC inhibitors, as I mentioned, and the beta blockers and, and diabetics. So, so remember this slide, because uh, that is uh, the importance of SGLT2 inhibitors in this sort of setting. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, the evidence available for benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure, Okay, what can you say about that? Emperor reduced. There are various trials. So one is Emperor reduced, and Tafire check is also there. There is newer trials like uh, Emperor Crystal are also coming out. So those are the trial evidence for SGLT2 inhibitors. Yeah, SGLT2 inhibitors are one of the class 1A. Uh, there are only four drugs, as I said uh, the AC inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, MRS, and the SGLT2. They are all class 1A. Um, uh, recommendations and uh, uh, it's a it's a novel drug with uh, uh, very interesting uh, mechanism of action. As you can see here, I'm not going to go into detail. SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, uh, in SGLT2 receptors, uh, re like contribute to 90% of the the glucose reabsorption. So what we are doing is giving a medicine to block the SGLT2 inhibitor in the proximal tubule. And you go to the next next uh, slide, please. And uh, and it will prevent glucose reabsorption. So if you do a UFR, you will have a truckload of glucose passing in your urine. And and uh, there are various mechanisms suggested. I'm not going to go into detail. Very interesting. Please read about it. And actually, although this was started like invented for uh, diabetic management, it was found out later on about the. The, the cardiac protection of SGLT2 inhibitors. So at the moment, a uh, lot of uh, data available for empaglifosine and depaglifosine, and also there are some canaglifosine trials coming up. And uh, as Kitmini mentioned, uh, emperor reduced trial uh, uh, for uh, empaglifosine and depa heart failure trial for depaglifosine, both has a both have a uh, relative reduction of like 25% in uh, heart failure, rehospitalization, and cardiovascular death. Uh, so, so that a lot of uh, data available, uh, well proven beyond doubt. So, uh, at least for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction patients, there is some evidence for uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients also. Uh, much of those are not uh, evidence not come as recommendations in the, in the heart failure guidelines. I hope in the next guidelines they will be available. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, the next question about ARNIs. ARNIs are not, not very new. Uh, they were there in the 2017 guidelines also, as I remember. Uh, what is the important? What, what do you think, uh, uh, Kitmini? It can be started as a replacement of uh, AC inhibitor or an ARB. Uh, that is where okay. we So, so it, it's an alternative drug for. It's inhibitors and uh, and ARBs, right? Can I uh, invite uh, Dr. Arun Maski uh, from uh, Nepal? Uh, Dr. Maski is, uh, is, uh, is from uh, the Society of Internal Medicine in, in Nepal, uh, uh, very senior, distinguished uh, uh, physician. Could you mention, uh, comment about uh, your opinions? I mean, if you... Yeah, talk about the guidelines. The current guidelines says, if feasible, start with ARNI because paradigm heart failure trials have shown benefit. Not only benefit with the heart failure hospitalization, mortality, they have reduced uh, uh, 
the, the diabetic uh, incidence and a lot of factors. So current recommendation is you should start RD. If not, then ACI. If for some financial or if they are not tolerated, ERBs. But, but the cost is very high. So you need to talk to the patients. What guidelines says is different. You need to talk to the patient. It's very expensive. So if we start uh, ACI, like inalapril, which is, I don't know, very cheaper. So we need to talk to the patient. And these are the drugs, despite them saying that these are very helpful, the trials have shown. So ideally, yes, if you can use, that's better. Start with a low dose. And because this patient has uh, acute palmedema, and this patient is diuretics, this patient is on HCLT2 inhibitors and monitoring this uh, patients with, uh, they, they would be in the middle corticoid receptor antagonists like spiral, uh, spironolactone or ipilirone. So cost is an important factor. If cost is not important factors, then as you have rightly mentioned, the, uh, this is the preferred drug instead of uh, ACI or ARBs. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, your point is well taken. Um, I, I have two, two small issues uh, about Arnis. As you said, it's a cost uh, because uh, in our country, uh, it's not widely available, mainly because of the cost and uh, people can't afford. And it is not available in the, in the public sector as well. I'm sure the situation is more or less the same in, in, in other uh, neighboring yes. countries. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and the second issue is the level of evidence. Uh, I know, uh, you know, if you look at the paradigm heart failure trial, it is uh, beyond doubt is well proven. Uh, as far as I remember, the, the, the mortality is reduced uh, by about 2.8 percent absolute mortality reduction compared to uh, uh, NLRP. Uh, however, it is, uh, I mean, at least one large trial is still there. Uh, so, uh, still in the guidelines, is a 1B recommendation. So, uh, uh, I mean, if, if the patient can afford, if, the, if, if, if it is available, uh, we can start it as a first choice. But I still, uh, in my practice at least, and in many of our colleagues in Sri Lanka also, start ACE inhibitors and, and ARBs as the, as the first choice. Uh, and in the guidelines, uh, in the previous guidelines, uh, how, you go to the next slide. Uh, what it says is, especially... Uh, uh, it is indicated as a replacement drug. Remember, it is a replacement drug. You can never give AC inhibitors and ARBs, uh, like you can't give ARNIS together with AC inhibitors or ARBs. So if you want to start an ARNI on a patient who has ARBs or AC inhibitors, you have to first stop it and wait for 36 hours and, and start uh, depending on the doses that they were on. Uh, AC inhibitors, you can decide, uh, decide the, uh, the doses of ARNI. So uh, the recommendation is replacement. Uh, uh, the further reduce the risk of heart failure, hospitalization, and death in ambulatory patients with reduced ejection fraction who remain symptomatic, especially the patients who remain symptomatic despite of giving optimal or maximum recommended doses of AC inhibitors and, and ARBs with MRS, this is indicated. So, so we can select the patients and because of the, the cost issue and all that, uh, we can select the patient and start. So when you start, remember how you start. Uh, go to the next slide, please. You first stop the ARB or the AC inhibitor, wait for 36 hours and start uh, the uh, uh, the last uh, 36,000 on the last day. And also, uh, if there's any history of angioedema, this is not a replacement. You can't give uh, ARNI to people who had angioedema for AC inhibitor. Okay. So we, let's go to the... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maske. Um, you, you, uh, recommend, your opinion was excellent. And what is the indication for starting uh, Iverberdine uh, in this patient? Uh, yes, Kidmini. Uh, so, Iverbertin is usually started when the prostate is bothering frequently uh, when the patient has been on beta blockers. But um, this, in this patient, we couldn't start Iverbertin because he's severely a high potency. 
So we didn't start it at the achieved setting. And he presented to us in day compensated time. Okay, so we couldn't use it. Yet. Yeah, uh, it is also not indicated at the beginning. Uh, now, we should know how it acts. So we go to the next slide. Euberdine is a, uh, it's a rate control medication. There is a, a channel called IF channel, or if we call it IF channel. IF channel in the SA node, it blocks it. And, uh, and it inhibits the SA node by um, blocking this channel. Uh, so it is important. You can use it even as an anti angina drug because it, it, it uh, reduces the exercise induced uh, tachycardia. But there is some evidence in the SHIFT trial. To go to the next uh, slide, uh, as you can see, there is a relative reduction compared to placebo. Uh, there is a relative reduction, risk reduction of 18% uh, in the in the shift trial. However, it is only indicated uh, two indications. One is when the when the patient can't tolerate, or when there is a contraindication of beta blockers, we can consider ibuprofen for this patient. So the first indication is when the patient can't uh, tolerate. So they, where there's a country like bronchial asthma, COPD patients having heart failure, we can't give beta blockers. Therefore, we can give, use everybody. It's very straightforward. Or else, sometimes we give the maximum dose of uh, beta blocker and the heart rate is still high, still above 70. After giving uh, a 25 milligram twice a day of carbidilone, or more 200 milligrams daily of metaprolol, or 10 milligrams of bisoprolol. If the heart rate is still high, you can add, it's not replaced like Arnie, you can add euberidine, uh, you can add 2.5 twice a day, 5.5 milligrams twice a day, up to 7.5 twice a day, to keep the heart rate around 60 or little below 60. So you can get additional benefit by doing that. Or else, the, the straightforward indication is when the patients can't see. But if without giving is, uh, beta blockers, when we can give or when we can increase the dose, there's no point in adding your body, which I normally see in, in, in uh, some uh, people doing it. Right? So first we treat because the evidence is for beta blockers. So you have to try and give the maximum tolerable, uh, maximum uh, recommended dose of beta blocker. After that, only we should consider your body therapy. Yeah, next. So can I ask one question? In yes. your slide, yes. you have said ivabradin has mortality benefit. Do you have any evidence? So far, I know this ivabradin has a neutral effect in mortality. In the SHIFT trial, there was a benefit. Uh, I can't remember whether it's a mortality benefit, but at least uh, in, the, in the SHIFT trial... Can you go to your back slide of a uh, few slides back of uh, mortality benefit? Yeah, it is mentioned in the, in the mortality benefit. I think in the sh shift trial, there was a mortality benefit. Uh, and uh, it may be small, but what normally uh, has happened in, in these trials are, you know, all the trials that we mentioned, they are uh, uh, primary endpoints are composite. Uh, there is a CV death, there is hospitalization, uh, uh, heart, heart failure of hospitalization and so on. So uh, the composite endpoint also has uh, mortality uh, and there was a small benefit. Now, when I mentioned about ARNI trial, it is also a um, uh, trial with composite endpoints, but if you take only the CV death, there was a absolute risk redu uh, death reduction of 2.8%. Likewise, in, in shift study also, there was a very small uh, mortality reduction. Okay, next one. Eubedin therapy. Uh, these are the contraindications in decompensated heart failure. In the acute stage, we don't normally use. And also severe hypertension, like in our patient, we couldn't give it at the beginning. And also, of course, uh, if there's a, a problem with uh, like bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias, risk of uh, sick sinus syndrome, third degree AV block, we shouldn't give eubedin. So those are the the contraindications. So we basically, in the later part of the discussion, we discuss about the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, and ARNIs and the and the uberidine. These are the newer drugs available to manage heart failure. 
acute heart failure and, and chronic heart failure. So know about the correct indications and also the contraindications and how you should use the drug. And also for the trainees, the trial evidence, uh, the main landmark trial evidence, uh, better to know. I think uh, with that, we will conclude. I must thank all of you. Uh, as I said, that the organizers of the global forum, especially for the Nandini Chatterjee and also uh, Dr. Ganaka Senarana and Dr. Arun Maski, uh, your, your uh, input, your comments so, were very valuable. So uh, I have one uh, last final question. What is your final diagnosis, Elipola? For this all this? Yeah. The, 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 patient was having uh, and uh, their compensation uh, uh, and we excluded other possible uh, etiological factors of decompensation and they were not there. And uh, because of uh, the, the patient decompensation and uh, uh, patient had gone into uh, cardiogenic shock uh, that, that sometimes happened. Uh, as I said, there can be mix of presentations in, in heart failure patients and uh, we, we manage, but uh, there are a lot, of, lot more things we have to do after the patient has recovered, uh, like doing coronary angiography uh, and revascularization possible for the optimization of heart, uh, heart failure medications and consider this patient for resynchronization uh, re and, and so on. And also, uh, more importantly, uh, patient education and improve the compliance and adherence to uh, our management with lifestyle uh, modifications as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Namal Vijay Singh and Dr. Keith Mini for this beautiful case presentation. Uh, there are two questions in the chat box. One of them is about the other choices of uh, ionotropic drugs in cardiogenic shock in the unavailability uh, situation of uh, this uh, noradrenaline. This is one yeah. question. Uh, so uh, Dr. Palani Appan has also joined IC. He is uh, Vice President API and uh, we had invited him also to be uh, in this. Uh, so uh, Welcome, Dr. Palani Appan. Uh, oh, he went. Uh, Professor Namal. Yeah. Now, uh, in the absence, uh, in, uh, like if you don't have noradrenaline, you can use adrenaline. Uh, and uh, if you don't have dobutamine, you can use uh, dopamine. Uh, so, likewise, uh, you, you can use other available uh, vasopressors and inotropes. Okay. And another question is how to titrate beta blockers and ACEI, how many weeks may be required as now, a patient uh, is in yeah, yeah, as you remember, about 20 years back when we started, uh, more than 20 years back, I think the U.S. Cardinal trial was uh, in 1999. Uh, it was published. We were very cautious uh, to start, like, you know, to start beta blockers. We used to admit the patients to the hospital, but we have more experience now. Uh, we can start beta blockers uh, before the discharge, after the first, uh, like after we start uh, the decompensation, uh, the acute episode. Uh, and uh, de again, depends on from patient to patient, depending on their fluid uh, status. Uh, we can uh, uh, quickly uh, increase, but you have to start uh, with small doses and slowly uh, increase. Uh, uh, like, you know, this is where uh, the help of a heart failure nurse is, uh, uh, is there. Is like in other countries, uh, these patients are looked after, also looked after by heart failure nurses. So they see them frequently and increase the dose. Not only uh, beta blockers and other, other medicines as well, like arnis and all that can be increased like that. Okay. But there's no, sir, clear, you... very, uh, no, no very clear um, uh, time frames. All okay. depends. It's, it's your clinical I... judgment. Can, can I add something? Yeah. Yes. So the recommendation is uh, if you're using beta blocker, uh, use long acting beta blockers. Not uh, in metoprolol, met uh, met uh, metoprolol succinate. And second in is some the, countries, current, in, in the some current countries, guidelines. There are, says, hmm. 
I mean, three, carbidinol, metoprolol, and uh, bisoprolol. So current yeah. recommendation is use the lowest drugs. Like if you're using bisoprolol or then 1.25, if you're using carbidinol, 3.125, metoprolol, 2.5, and wait at least for two weeks. Two Make weeks. sure the patient is dry, eovolumic. Do not start the patient if the patient has congestions. So make the patient congestion free, preferably before discharge, and do not increase that dose before two weeks. So that's the current recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sir, would you, uh, would you ask uh, Dr. Palani Appan to uh, have his input? Yeah, Dr. Palani Appan, uh, yeah, thank you so much yeah. for joining. Uh, uh, we were like, discussing about SGLT2 inhibitors uh, uh, earlier, uh, their role in heart failure management. Uh, uh, would you like to add uh, uh, your opinion about it? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Nandini and my dear friend, Jodhir Mai Paul, for asking me to join this. Actually, just now we have finished the meeting uh, in the inaugural function. So heart failure management is very, very important. And uh, nowadays, uh, a lot of things came out in the studies. So HLT2 inhibitor is one of the pillar of heart failure management. Nowadays, we are calling four pillars of heart failure. That is ARNI, either ARNI or AC inhibitor, or ARB. Second is HLT2 inhibitor, MRA, and beta blocker four pillars of heart failure. So HLT2 inhibitor, it's a very, very important. It has got a, it, 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 not only it reduces the mass as well as heart failure incidence, even preserved ejection fraction, it can be used. Class 2A indicator, because HLT2 inhibitor can not only it can be used for diabetic patient, in non-diabetic patient also, it can be used in the preserved ejection fraction with a preserved ejection fraction. So important two molecule nowadays, what we are having. So HLT2 is a preserved ejection fraction you can use. Especially empagliflozin, it has been tried. It reduces CV mortality also. Not only reduces the hospitalization of the heart failure, reduces the mortality benefit. And another important thing is MRA, phenirnone. It's an anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic action, not only in the heart, it has got anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic action in the kidneys also, kidneys also. So mortality benefits are there. So HLT2 inhibitor, so wonderful role, MRA, two game changers and ORNI. It's very, very important to use. Nowadays, many people, they are scared to use in acutely decompensed heart failure. In my clinical practice, after treating the acutely decompensed heart failure, heart failure, immediately you have to use the patient is on already AC inhibitor. You have to with, we have to stop 36 hours before starting ARNI. But uh, AC, AC, I mean R, ARB immediately you can start. So now important two points I want to emphasize as a clinician and I am doing echo and everything. So actually, if the systolic BP is maintained more than 100 millimeter of mercury uh, without inotropic support or last six hours, there is no diuretic dosage increase. Means immediately, please start them on ORNI. That's very, very important. Because if you use ORNI early, the first 14 days, you are getting the nt reduction by 75%, first 14 days. The next, next uh, uh, that is uh, uh, 11 and a half months, you are getting only 25% reduction only. So immediately decompensated into homeric and heart, immediately use that molecule, uh, mo molecule to get a fantastic benefit. Nowadays, previously, after invention of the ORNI, previously, great for diastolic dysfunction, only the death sentence, within one year, they, be, they will die. After the invention of this ORNI molecule, definitely the longevity has been increased by at least five years to 10 years. There are a lot of, uh, so nowadays after this molecule only, they have coined this word heart failure with the improved ejection fraction. 
previously 35 percent after in after using this all four pillars of drugs the the ef is improving improving by another 10 percent and nowadays heart failure management all the physicians should know e bar e ratio routinely do, doing echo you should measure the e bar e ratio whether it's improvement is there that's why this is one of the important tool you have to do and echo all the physicians should be complete do, to do uh, echocardiography and nowadays fifth pillar evaporin can also be added after not controlling with the not controlled heart rate that is 50 to 60 it's not controlled and bp is low less than 100 or 100 if you want to reduce the heart rate you have to add as an add-on therapy with the previously existing that is cardio selective beta blocker that is only three that is sustained release sorry sustained release metaprolol or carbidolol or pisoprolol three molecules are approved so these are all the important practical tips I want to give for the physicians. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Nandini. Thank you so much, Dr. Palaniyappan. I think that was the important. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Palaniyappan. Yeah, one one small uh, so, uh, additional yes. thing I want to tell you uh, yes. uh, to Dr. Arun Mathi is uh, I, I checked uh, while uh, Dr. Palaniyappan was giving his uh, opinion. Uh, shift trial. Uh, uh, showed the mortality benefit uh, for Weberdine uh, is an uh, absolute uh, risk reduction of 2%. Uh, the placebo group had 5% heart failure deaths, and the Weberdine had only 3% heart failure deaths. But this trial was a primary composite endpoint of uh, heart failure deaths and uh, heart failure hospitalization. The main benefit was for the heart failure hospitalization, but there was a 2% absolute risk benefit uh, for mortality. So, shall we with, uh, yes. conclude with that? Yes. Uh, thank yes. You so much. Uh, we have. And also, come I must the thank uh, Dr. Kitmini uh, because uh, she did an excellent presentation yes, and uh, uh, yeah, yes. bravely discussed uh, in front of an international audience. Yes, so, uh, yes, absolutely. Very nicely presented. And uh, to summarize the messages of this day is that oxygen. There is a definite indication of saturation less than 90%. Uh, then if your patient has too less blood pressure, we cannot start on ACE or beta blockers immediately. And we have the SGLT2 at the beginning. We have survival benefit for the four pillars of management. Though cost is an important issue in our South Asian countries, the ARNI is being projected as a very good drug if our patient is able to afford it. And if there are contraindications to beta blockers or the heart rate is not being controlled, we have to take recourse to Eva Brady. Uh, so we have come to the end of this master class and I would thank all the participating countries, all the panelists, as well as the participants and students for taking part. Uh, is Professor Jyotir Pal here? Is he able to join? Yes, yes. yes sir, <laughs> your face is dark. Sir, please, please address this conglomeration. This is your vision and you must uh, encourage uh, all of us. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I must congratulate the entire Global Forum team for conducting such an international webinar. And definitely Professor Jolil Chaudhary, my elder brother and my senior from Bangladesh, I know him for last month, and also Professor Namal Singh has taken a lot of pain to update the students of this India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, all students are much benefited with such a deliberation. And we are hopeful that in future we will continue such endeavor. And, and I am very much thankful to the three president, Professor. Girish Mathur, Professor Kumudini, Professor Odun Maske, you have kindly present in all, all and encouraged us. And in future, we hope our collaboration, our friendship, our brotherhood will further. Thanks to Professor Nikaraji, you have conducted us and you have planned the intersection and find.
uh, thanks to all members and students of this four country thank you well, thank, thank you, you and, uh, good night. and good night and good night uh, we will meet again hopefully after one to two months thank, thank you. you thank you also. yeah thank, thank you. you thank you good night thank you nandini good night oh. thank you